Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. So every golf club has three basic design features. Number one, the club leans on an angle to the inside of the target line. Well, guess what? That's the angle you should swing it on. Number two, the club is built so that when it strikes the ball, it should lean towards the target. Well, when you do that, it creates maximum pressure on the golf ball. The golf ball squeezes down to a portion of its normal size, and when it expands, it shoots like a bullet off the face. What's the third thing? If you swing it on its angle, then the club face tends to rotate in accordance with that angle, what we call swing plane. So you're telling me that the entire secret for how to hit a golf ball is presented in the way they designed my golf club. Yes. So why is it that people grab these clubs and instead of swinging them on a tilt, they swing them straight up and down on a straight line? Why is it that instead of delivering a forward-leaning shaft, they deliver a backward-leaning shaft? And why is it instead of having the face rotate with the plane, it usually rotates somewhere else? Because they have no idea what they're trying to do. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to Golf Smarter for members only, Jeff. Hey, Fred, again, thanks so much for having me. I love being on the show. Oh, well, thank you. That's um, true. I do love being on the show. Do you? I'm not just saying that, no. It's a great show. <laughs> yeah, you are just saying that. <laughs> I'm not just saying that. Well, listen, you agreed to come back on, so I gotta, I've got to believe some of that. Of course. <laughs> Well, thanks. I truly appreciate it because I, I really get a lot out of our conversations and it helps me a lot. Um, in, in talking about the golf school um, and the, the work that you and Martin would do over a period of time with students, um, when you talk about taking ownership of making these changes, uh, how, many, how many things on a weekend, you know, like two days of school, how many things can you actually effectively change on a middle handicap uh, golfer and have it stick? That's a good question. And, and it really all comes down to um, what your perspective is on coaching. And very early... Your perspective as a coach or your perspective as a student? Uh, well, mostly as a coach and then how okay. you relay that to a student, so to speak. So um, very early in my coaching career... Um, the way that I taught the full swing was a little bit different from how I taught, you know, chipping. And then it was different from how I taught pitching and sand. And then there was putting. And it was almost like there were all these different games, so to speak, that you had to learn. And, hey, your full swing grip was like this and your putting grip was like this. And if you're going to try and hit a, a chip shot, then you can actually change your grip a little bit. And, you know, all those things, you know, might be true from a coaching perspective, you know, based on a certain methodology. But they're not a very effective way to help people learn and sustain improvement. So, over the years, you know, I started thinking a lot more about you know, the similarities, so to speak, between one shot and the next. And, and I really found that every golfer has a pattern. And that pattern exists really in every shot they hit. So, for example, if they're slicing their drive, then they're very often cutting their putts. If they hit too much up on the ball on a chip shot, then they probably hit too much uh, up on the ball on a pitch, on a putt, on a tee shot or whatever. You know? So what I started doing is looking at you know, what was the root causal problem? What was their one basic fundamental flaw, if you will, that were leading to all these issues with their golf game? And then we start tackling, you know, making that particular adjustment. So, you know, what I do now, and a lot of this was really born from uh, a quote that I heard from Bobby Jones years ago. He said, play as many shots as possible with the same basic thoughts in mind. And that really resonated with me. So now when I look at someone's game, let's say you came in for a lesson day one and I had never seen your game before. In the first 15 minutes, I'll say, okay, Fred, go ahead and, and hit a few six irons and then go ahead and show me a couple tee shots. And then I'll have you turn to the left and I'll have you pitch one to the green and then I'll have you roll a putt. You know, within just a few minutes, I can see what your pattern is in your entire game. And then from there, based on what you're looking for, whether it be full swing work or short game work, we'll actually spend time working on that one particular skill. But once you learn what the new skill is, so to speak, the cool thing about this approach is now you can transition through every single shot in the game playing with the same basic idea. Because the whole key here is changing the impact to change the flight. So your club's either swinging down too much or it's swinging up too much. Your club face is either open or it's closed. You're either hitting off the toe or the heel. And if you're doing that, 
it's happening everywhere. Now, the one thing about golf is that you know, certain swing flaws uh, are more conducive to success uh, for certain shots, whereas they lead to total disaster in other shots. So, for example, uh, if you had too much sweep in your golf swing, uh, you might hit your tee ball just fine, but you might absolutely struggle in the bunker. So all of a sudden you say, you know what, my driver swing's pretty good, but, you know, something's wrong with my bunker swing. It's the same swing, but based on the particular shot, one is getting decent success, and the other one is total failure, even oh. though the flaw is exactly the same. Wow. So what I do, I try and get people excited. I say, okay, this is your pattern. This is what we have to work on. Let's find success with our six iron or our sandwich or whatever we're working on. And then before the lesson's over, many times I'll take them through every shot and I'll say, no, this is how it applies to this, and this is how it applies to that. And look, we're putting. And look, it's kind of the same thing, isn't it? And that's when the light bulb goes on for them because now – People that have viewed the game as being very big and scary and daunting all of a sudden go, you know what? It's it's just this this one thing. And you remember the movie City Slickers? Sure. Yeah, you know, and uh, you know Billy Crystal and yep. and um, uh, Jack Palance and whatnot. <laughs> and, the, and they're sitting there, and, and all the guys that, just one. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. You know, and he, and he goes, he goes, you know, what you need to understand is the, the secret to life. You know. And he holds out his hand, and Billy Crystal goes, "Your finger? You know that's secret of life." He yeah, goes, right. "He goes, no, it's not not my finger. It's it's this one thing." And that's what I try and do with people in their golf games. You know, the secret to their success or changing their their ball flight throughout their game is usually just just one basic thing, one basic area, one basic concept. And um, when you can make that work as a coach, man, you can take someone's game and just totally flip it around in a very very short period of time. That's really interesting, um, and and it makes me actually think of the uh, of Martin Chuck's the Tour Striker Training Club, um, because I, I I just realized by working with that a bit how where major swing flaws I saw major flaws and and by you connecting the dots for me of saying it's the same swing whether I'm in the bunker I'm in the tee I'm you know at a hundred yards out or twenty yards out. Uh, it's the same swing and uh, it's the same mistake. Just sometimes right. it works better than others. Right, and I, and I'm not going to you know diminish the the subtle nuances within the game. I mean, certainly, you know, we change ball position on certain shots. We change our weight in certain shots. Um, there are certain shots which are specialty shots where we might change, you know, how we're releasing the club or, or little things that happen on the advanced level. You know, so for listeners that are listening to this, going. You know, I can't believe this guy's telling me it's just one thing. It's all the same swing. Yeah, I, I understand that, right? Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is that from a um, learning perspective, you know, the more you can take something that's complex and make it seem simple and doable, the more fun you have and the faster you progress. Mm-hmm. You know, so as we start moving through shots, as I start seeing someone's skill level increase – then I certainly like to pepper in some of these little nuances that can take them to a more advanced level. But, you know, there is a progression to learning that exists everywhere. Uh, but people, a lot of times, don't seem to think that it exists in, in golf. And um, if you look at gymnastics, for example, you know, you take your daughter to a gymnastics class and she's five years old and she wants to do backflips on a balance beam in the Olympics. They don't just put her up on a six foot high balance beam and say, you know, give it a go. And that's not what they do because there's a consequence, which is, you know, potentially breaking your neck. You know, so what do they do? They have a coach put the arm underneath the little girl and then they take their other hand and they flip their legs over. Right. So that's kind of like a, an assisted backflip. And the kid does that a couple of times. And then from there, once the coach feels like uh, the, the push off of the legs and the and the rotation is where it could possibly be safe. And then the little girl does it, but they land in a big, you know, uh, foam pit, right? Uh, and then once they they see from a coaching perspective that that's happening, then they go, okay, let's try and do this on flat ground again. But we're going to do it uh, just landing, you know, right on right on the turf, and we're going to still be sure, there. Watching it's, all, it. it's all a progression. Yeah, yeah. And then it goes from there. Then they paint a white line on the ground, and then they put the balance beam up six inches, and they do it. And then they, you know, do it off of the high balance beam. And and golfers, they show up to the lesson tee, and they all of a sudden expect to sometimes engage in in technique, so to speak, that is at the tour level when they don't have the basic fundamentals to. Mm. Uh, to create the the basic contact behind hitting shots. So we always get to start with 
from a coaching perspective, you know, what types of ideas are going to get you in the air and forward, hitting the club face solidly, getting around the course. And then from there, as you start to demonstrate skill, that's when the coach can really open up his or her playbook, so to speak, and give you the things that you might want day one, which are really reserved for day 360. That pretty much answers my, my other question about follow through, follow up is, is if you're teaching them to understand on their own where their flaws are, where the inconsistencies are, they should be able to take that with them, right? Absolutely. And a lot of times, well, actually all the time, I talk to my students about trying to get into the coach's mind. And the coach's mind is all about understanding you know, where we are now the kind of impact and flight we have now, where we're trying to go, why we're trying to go there, and then to be able to look at basic cause and effect and make a decision as to whether or not I'm doing the right amount, too much, or not enough of what my goal is. So you know, right now, for example, if you're looking at your, your impact, you might have divots that are too deep. You might be hitting it off the toe. You might be slicing it to the right. You know, so you have an impact and a flight. Those are your outcomes. So let's say you try and flatten your swing through, you know, whatever idea the coach gives you and you understand, you know, what he's talking about and why you're doing it. Now, as you start hitting shots, I mean, you shouldn't be looking for the perfect shot. You should be looking for a different shot. And to me, a different shot would be less divot, ball more towards the center of the face, maybe less of a curve to the right, maybe a curve to the left. So I'm never trying to get people to their perfect flight right away. I'm trying to get them to a different flight that is opposite of what they came in at. And the thing is, a lot of people, they will sort of be a, uh, a non-participant, so to speak, in their learning process, where they're just kind of waiting for the coach to say, oh, more like this, more like that. But the thing is, is I want my students to be thinking their way through everything. And the moment they make contact, to realize that that divot that you just created was way different than the divot you had 10 minutes ago. That contact on the face was way different than it was when you walked in the door. That ball flight, that trajectory is twice as high or twice as low or that ball's curving you know, less or more. So once you can get them understanding what's happening, increasing their awareness, you know, then they're really in a position to coach themselves through it. And this is the same thing that happened to me when I was taking guitar lessons back in the day. I would start playing chords and, and I thought they sounded great. You know? And then my, my instructor would actually record us and I would be like, what is all that noise? <laughs> <laughs> and, and all the noise that was surrounding, you know, the chord that I was playing was the buzzing of all the strings that were supposed to be muted that were half ringing out because I didn't have my hands in the proper position to get that pure sound. And I never heard it until he made me aware of it. And once I was aware of it and understood it, I could start coaching myself and making those changes. And the same thing applies to, to golf. You know, you got to increase your golf IQ and increase your awareness of what's happening. Uh, in order to to really, you know, coach yourself and to, and to be your own coach, so to speak. I thought, and I thought for sure you were going to say. And once I realized that um, all that extra noise was there, I just quit playing guitar. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, forget it. If I can't do this, I'm I'm out of here. Right? No, but and know, I think there are golfers that do that. I, I think that there are golfers who quit. Um, well, because this game is so damn hard, but, uh, I, I think that people quit cause it's like, I, I can't, I can't do that. Well, it usually comes down to, I, I won't do that. Oh. You know? So the thing, the thing is, is that, um, another thing I start every lesson off with is, you know, someone will hit this ball flight, which, which they are deeming in their mind to be bad or, or terrible, which we all know is just an ego based response. But the thing is, is they'll hit a shot. And I'll say, you know, what I want you to understand here is that uh, your golf swing is absolutely perfect. And, of course, they roll their eyes and they're like, why did I even show up here to talk to this guy? I go, no, no, hang on. <laughs> your golf swing is perfect for the result that you're getting. Hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, your golf ball, it's like a computer. You type something in, it spits something out. Right? And the thing is, is that uh, most golfers are out there, and I've said this before in the show, most golfers are out there trying to make a better swing. But your mind has no idea what better is. Now, your mind can start to conceptualize what different is. And if you make a different swing, I promise you'll get a different result. So when golfers are out there saying, you know, I've been slicing for, for 20 years, 
and I've taken 50 lessons and I can't stop slicing. You know, what's wrong with me? I'll say, you keep making the same swing. Mm-hmm. How's that possible? You keep getting the same result. You know, so basically what you have to do if you're a slicer and you have an overload of slicing fundamentals, which are perfect for bending the ball to the right. So if you understand what those fundamentals are, then you can say, okay, well, what could I do? Not better, but what could I do differently to make a ball bend left? So if you took your slicing grip and made it a hooking grip, if you took the tension in your arms, which was conducive to slicing, and you made it softer, which is easier to hook, if you changed your posture or the distance you stood from the ball, anything you change, Fred, is going to make the ball do something different. You just have to know what to change, and the ball flight will change immediately. Will it be comfortable? No, no. no. Are you... Maybe, maybe not. I mean, it depends on your um, it depends on your perspective of what comfort is. So, for example, golfers also think about their golf swings in singular terms. Oh, I'm going to work on my golf swing. This is my golf swing today. Well, I mean, you think Tiger Woods has one swing? I mean, he's got like a hundred swings because he's got different ball flights he's trying to hit during the round. If he hits his ball under the trees on the right, and he has to hit a slice back into play then he has to incorporate slicing fundamentals into his swing. If he hits his ball into the trees on the left and he's got to hook the ball back into play, he has to incorporate hooking fundamentals into his swing. He's changing his swing on every swing based on how high he wants to hit it, how low he wants to hit it, how much spin he wants or doesn't want, what kind of curvature he wants. Does he want two yards, five yards, ten yards? I mean, everything has to change to create a change in the ball flight. Yeah, I remember there was – was it you? Somebody I was talking to on the show, and they said, yeah, well, Tiger Woods has no ego. I'm like, what? He says, well, Tiger never takes a shot that he hasn't practiced a thousand times. Sure. And it's like, oh, that kind of ego. Okay, that makes sense. But but you're right. I mean, it's he's not going to try to – which I, I know that I do and we do. And, you know, uh, most golfers, I would say, that are – you know, the handicap that I, I'm thinking about, um, not talking a single-digit thing, but but – it's will definitely go. Yeah, I know I can do this, and whatever, never even trying it on the driving yeah. range. Fred, this this whole thing about coaching, it is all about the coach creating the proper mindset and learning environment from the student to make a big change fast. It's not about the ownership. You know, ownership takes patience, will, and discipline. But any coach that understands how to do this can change your ball flight change it immediately and move it a lot closer to if not give you the exact ball flight that you want in a very short time it's not you know five lessons it's not 10 lessons it's not a six months program it is literally in the first 15 minutes to one hour of time that ball flight should change and do something that you've never seen it do before and it's all about embracing this idea of different versus better if the students in a learning environment where they're okay with doing something differently listening to the coach Learning versus performing, it will change, and it will change absolutely right now. And I tell people that all the time. In fact, I tell people, I say, Fred, if you come out to my lesson team, and uh, and if you don't have the best golf learning experience of your lifetime, and hit the ball better than you ever have in less than an hour, then don't pay me. That's how strongly I feel about my ability to change people's ball flights and change people's golf games instantaneously based on communication and coaching. It's awesome. what I hang my hat on. It's what I do. And if the experience isn't the best, then you can go home and never come back again. Mm. Well, that's why you keep getting invited back here. Cause I haven't asked my money back yet, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. You know, but you know, when I think about it from a coaching perspective, I mean, how many golfers out there would like their instructor to put their neck on the line like that? Oh Yeah. Oh, absolutely. To be able to say, I I guarantee this will be the best golf lesson you've ever had or don't pay. No, I don't think think most, I I don't think most instructors can afford to say that, you know, not. Well, if if you're trained properly, then, then you should be able to do that because it's accountability. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, when I, when I show up and and I pay for a particular service, you know, I'm expecting to, to get a lot of value out of the service, you know, and why shouldn't people expect that same amount of delivery from from a coach? Now, on their own, you know, if they're not willing to do the work, you know, then that's a different thing. But the thing is that um, in most cases, people show up to a golf lesson and, and they really want to learn. They want to hear what you have to say. Uh, very few people come out and are 
are, are, are difficult or standoffish or uh, against what you have to say. They're coming to you for help. You know, so right now, they're um, in a submissive position. They're saying, help me learn how to do this. Uh, and as long as the coach can control that learning environment and they understand basic cause and effect, uh, every learning uh, experience should be uh, amazing and fulfilling for, for everyone that engages in it. Can I change gears here for a second? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, well, I have never been to the PGA show in Orlando and everyone, right? <laughs> everyone. Uh, a lot of the instructors, a lot of the people that I talk to on this show send me emails. Hey, you're going to be at the show this year? You gonna, it's like, no, I live in yeah. California. That's a long way away and I can't afford to go. But if you want to bring me out there, I'd be more than happy to go. But um, you got to go to the show this year. I did. I did. And, it's something that... Um, that I do every year, and that's it's a good thing for. Uh, well, then let's start with this: is if you go every year, what is the state of the show? What is the state of the industry from your perspective uh, today? Well, I mean, the show. I've been going to the show, Fred, since uh, since I was a kid. My, my my father, you know, we talked about before. He's a he's a golf professional. Um, he was a you know full time PGA professional, acting as a club pro. Now he actually has a um, a product for golf pros called Ghost Tape. Have you ever heard of ghost tape before? No? No. I'm still thinking. <laughs> well, no, of course I'm not, because you're, you're a consumer. You're not a golf pro. So basically, right. that's for sure. Um, you know, golf clubs that, uh, that professionals purchase for inventory, sometimes they loan them out for people to try. And sometimes when people try them, they don't they, come back. They, they nick them up, though. They uh, oh. take deep divots and they, you know, make ball marks on the top. So, uh, uh, the inventory becomes worthless to the professional. So my dad created this product called Ghost Tape. It protects clubs. So now my point is in all this is that he's down at the show every year uh, as a vendor as opposed to being a buyer. But I've been going to this show. So since, now you get to go see your dad. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so I've been going to this show since I was a kid. And when I was a kid, I used to run through the aisles and I'd be collecting pamphlets, you know, mountains of garbage that my mother would say, you're not all taking All the freebies. Funny. All the freebies. And uh, yeah, the great thing about the show is that it's it's – the one week a year or three or four days a year where the literally the entire golfing industry, you know, across the globe is all gathered or congregated in one place. Mm-hmm. And it's just amazing to see how many brands there are. It's amazing to see how many knickknacks there are for sale and training aids and lines of apparel. And it's, um, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's, um, you know, maybe 1.2 miles or something like that, you know, wow. indoors that you walk through all this stuff, it's, it's, it's massive. And I think it's actually the world's largest trade show, but, um, some of the companies, man, they really go all out with, uh, with their displays. I mean, I guess it would be sort of like, um, when people watch on television, they'll see, uh, some kind of an auto show, so to speak, where Ford introduces the 2012 line of cars. And it's like this big gala event. Yeah, sure. That's kind of the way it is for, Oh yeah, absolutely. But, but cool. the but the state of the golf industry in 2012 is very different than it was in 2002. Yeah. And you know, how the, do you see that being reflected at the show? Well, the, the show used to be massive. I mean, it's still massive now, but if you went um, you know, 15 years ago, it would seem even even bigger. And yeah. there there was a time where uh, it really contracted quite a bit where people showed up and they said, what happened? You know, it just wasn't the same. And then the last couple of years, it's actually, you see some of the manufacturers coming back that maybe weren't there before. Um, but it's not quite back to the full strength like it, like it used to be mm-hmm. and, you know, for obvious reasons. But it's kind of a cool thing. I, I go down there not so much to see the products. I go down there to, um, you know, to try and advance my career as a coach. I mean, all the, the top magazines are there. All the TV networks are there. Um, this year I went down there and I was a, uh, product spokesperson for for Ping. Uh, they have a brand new uh, in-flight software app that uh, coaches are using these days, or club fitters are using these days. So I did a presentation with them, and I was also down there with Sligoware, which is a uh, the company out of Canada that I uh, am sponsored with. So I spent some time in their booth. So some of it's meet and greet, some of it's uh, you know trying to advance your career with the right circle, so to speak, and then um, you know some of it's just connecting with your peers and, and trying mm-hmm. to find out what the best practices might be. You know, I, I told you a little bit back here that um, I started a new company called Square It Up, which is uh, a marketing, personal branding, graphic design, website design company for, for golf, the, the golf business, but, you know, most specifically targeted towards golf professionals, people like myself that are, you know, trying to create a, you know, a personal brand or a personal business that, um, you know, is relevant 
you know, on a global scale. And, and a lot of people that are small business owners have been conditioned to, to kind of think small, you know, to look at the 25 miles that surround their facility, um, to not understand just how much leverage and how much power they can have uh, in this market if they can utilize things like social media properly and that yeah. don't understand or they haven't been trained, so to speak, to understand yep. uh, the secrets of marketing and branding. So I went down there and actually did a, a big presentation for the Golf Business Network, which meets down there. Uh, every year as well. So I guess from my perspective, it was, you know, part sideshow, part meet and greet, you know, part uh, launching this new business called Squared Up and then just trying to you know, find a place to rest my feet, man, because it is a long, long day. <laughs> so um, since um, I really wanted to hear your perspective on, on products that are out there, but uh, clearly yeah. that wasn't it. But but what what do you hear? What it, What's the buzz? What is... Yeah, I, I think that's what I want to say. What's the buzz on the floor from the industry professionals about the okay. industry? Yeah, well, I mean, let's talk technology for a second. So from okay. a coaching perspective, people love love technology. Yep. And um, I think that the one piece of technology that I'd like to know more about, um, and I didn't get a chance to look at it that closely, but it was really a big topic of discussion. Podcasting. Is a product, no, it was a product called, <laughs> yeah. uh, it was a, uh, an analysis software slash program called Golf Guru, and uh, it was really you know using sort of 3D motion analysis in a very creative way, much like you'd see uh, in an Xbox style video game um, that a lot of coaches were really buzzing about. It was almost sort of taking that lesson experience to the next level and doing things um, now with seemingly simple uh, platforms uh, in terms of you know size or price points or whatnot. Um, that five, 10 years ago, you know, probably would have cost $20,000 for, for a pro to be able to do. So that was something that was really, really cool. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, are, are you finding there are, uh, more, well, I guess you wouldn't see it. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to ask if there are more coaches that are like, I can't continue to do this anymore. They, they I just can't sustain this business because I'm not a businessman. I'm a golf instructor, right? Yes, Absolutely. I mean, that's why we started the company. And the thing is, I mean, the thing is, is that there are so many coaches in this industry that are losing ground versus gaining ground. And the sad thing is, is that they're all extremely talented coaches. I mean, when you think about, you know, golf lessons, I don't think about golf lessons as um, just golf instruction. I think about the potential value or impact uh, a golf instructor um, who's qualified can have on a person's life. You know, you're talking about number one, helping them attain a skill level and something they enjoy. Uh, if you're coaching, you know, the mental aspect of the game, you know, the attitudes that you learn help you on and off the course. If your coaching uh, infuses nutrition, I mean, you can definitely help people with, you know, aches and pains and lose weight and improve their health. If you're working with kids, you can help them get college scholarships. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But when you look at what a coach truly can do, if he, he or she is good, I mean, the impact of the consumer is huge. And it's a really important thing uh, for coaches to be able to see what their own value is. But from there, be able to understand the practices of being a business person, like you said, that allow you to show the world what that value is and have them engage with you on a more uh, consistent basis, so to speak. So you know, that's why it's all about branding these days. I mean, the only difference between Jim McLean and David Ledbetter and Butch Harmon and Hank Haney and, and some other instructor that's really fantastic out in the Midwest that maybe doesn't have the same credentials. It just comes down to awareness. And with social media, there are no more gatekeepers. There's no one that says you can or can't be, be seen or heard or whatnot. So it's really about encouraging pros to, to build brands, uh, to create content, to push it out there, mm -hmm. and to believe in the possibility that exists within this amazing skill set that you have of being able to not only help people have fun, but also maybe help them find ways to improve their lives. In that buzz, do you find that a lot of uh, the old school instructors are uh, accepting the power of what the web can deliver? Slowly. Yeah. They, they, are, they are slowly, um, but they're also... It's the young guns like you that are coming up going, you're missing the point. They're understanding that you have to, you have to change, you know, otherwise you're going to be replaced. And, um, 
you know, my clientele now, I mean, ever since, you know, we've talked about social media, we talked about YouTube, my YouTube channel just went over 4 million views, by the way, which was kind of a milestone for me. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. You know, I've got three people on my lesson to you right now from Korea and I'm teaching them every day for 30 straight days. Yeah, that's, that's powerful, right? Yeah. Um, I've got someone right after them coming from, from Luxembourg for a similar program. I just answered a guy from Australia who wants to try to find a way to bring me to Australia. I mean, and that's all because the world they've is heard them. They've heard you on Golf Smarter. Yeah, that's right. They've heard me on the Golf Smarter podcast. Nah. But, you know, <laughs> so the, the older guys, to answer your question, um, you know, they're, they're seeing some, some younger pros, so to speak, do some really good things. And um, I think that the uh, the sound of the noise is loud enough, so to speak, that they're realizing that, you know, maybe one year of a down year or two years of a down year or three years of having a down year, you know, can be, um, you know, put on the, the economy, so to speak. But I mean, there are people that are really thriving in this marketplace right now. And, and I'm lucky to be one of them. And uh, it just shows you that when you deal with a global market versus a local market, there's more than enough golfers uh, to make a wonderful living coaching the game. And there's more than enough golfers for, for every coach who has that dedication and that mindset of being a good person in business to do the same. So, Yeah, yeah being, being a club pro is just not enough. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult because, you know, when you, you know, when you work for yourself, when you have this ability to create a personal brand, then, of course, you have the ability to select who your target market is going to be. You know, right. when you're working as a club professional, um, you know, you're working under the parameters of, a, of ownership or a management company and they have certain expectations. Someone else's brand, right? Yeah, someone else's branding. So one of the interesting things is that, you know, and I got this from the book Crush It, which was the Gary Vaynerchuk book. I mean, he basically said that, you know, whether you love your job or not, everybody, everybody should be creating and actively building their own personal brand. Mm -hmm. Because when you create your own personal brand and you leverage that brand across a worldwide marketplace through things like social media, I mean, that is the ultimate offensive strategy in in job security. You know, I I hope to be at the Raven Golf Club Phoenix for a long, long time. Um, But if if there comes a day where for some reason uh, they want to go in a different direction, uh, it's really not going to affect me, and I'm not that worried about it. Because, you know, I've got enough um, traction, so to speak, uh, everywhere where mm-hmm. there's a million other places, whether local or, or abroad, that I know that I could continue doing what I'm doing and having a great time doing it. Um, so it's all about security. It's all about possibility. It's all about feeling empowered. It's all about feeling in control of the things that you're doing in life. And I think that a lot of people don't feel like they're so much in control or in control as much as they'd like to be, you know, and all, it all starts with the mindset and all starts with what you build and, and how you leverage that. Interesting. So, uh, uh, favorite product that you saw at this year's PGA show? Favorite product, uh, at the PGA show this year. Um, it'd have to be the golf guru thing. Like I said, I didn't see it that much, but it looked really cool. It looked okay. worthy of favorite. All right. Then favorite consumer product. Favorite. Well, it's gotta be Sligo wear, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to do I, anything to my game. I don't oh. care about it's like you know loud mouth pants. I don't care. <laughs> I want to know what's gonna what's gonna uh, I, that I need to really consider buying because well, it's going to enhance my enjoyment I'll of t- playing. I'll tell you what, you yeah, know, and I'm, I'm going to give my business partner a plug here. I mean, training aids um, for golf. I mean, they're, they're a difficult thing. I mean, there's a lot oh of training God, aids yes. out there. Yes, um, but the thing is, is that. Most training aids are not infallible. So, I mean, you could buy something, um, but there's no guarantee that you're going to use it in the way that it was intended to be used. And, and a lot of times when, when somebody launches a training aid, they'll, they'll hand it to, to Nick Faldo and they'll say, hey, what do you think of this? Well, he's got a phenomenal swing. So all the things that, <laughs> all, all the, things that the training aid is supposed to do seem to work just perfect because you have a you know, phenomenal golfer swinging it. So the real well, you know, you know what? Wait, wait. I gotta say that is such an interesting point that you know we we watch these infomercials and we watch these guys who are saying this is great. Well, it's like what? You, it didn't change anything for you. Right. You're, you're absolutely right. right. Thank so, you. So you know, every training aid 
really needs to have a certain level of coaching associated with it so that it's used properly, you know, so that, you know, there's a blueprint in the mind of, of, the, of the user. Um, so there's a lot of training aids that people buy. They don't know how to use them. Uh, they're not being purchased for a, a particular problem that uh, the training aid can fix. And as a result, you go into someone's garage and there's a bunch of training aids and they're all piled up. One thing that's really unique about Martin Chuck's uh, Tour Striker product is that um, the feedback that you get uh, mm-hmm. is immediate. The understanding of how to use the golf club is, is on a level that's really not associated with most training aids. And I just did a video that's uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, I posted it yesterday, and it was all for for kids. But you know, most people um, when they come out for a golf lesson, they want to know the how. But they never uh, consider uh, to ask about the why. And what I'm referring to is they come out and say, well, how do I swing my arms? Where should I put my grip? When do I turn my hips? Now, coming down, is it, is it from the ground up? You know, what is my left knee doing? And they want to know all, all, of the, all of the how stuff. But they never even look at the basic design of their equipment and ask the question, why in the world did the nice men and women at Ping design this club to look like this? Well, they've designed it to look like that because they had a certain functionality in mind. You know, so every golf club has three basic design features you know, that I look at when I'm building a golf swing. Number one, the club leans on an angle to the inside of the target line. Well, guess what? That's the angle you should swing it on, right? Mm-hmm. Number two, the club is built so that when it strikes the ball, it should lean towards the target. Well, when you do that, it creates maximum pressure on the golf ball. The golf ball squeezes down to a portion of its normal size, and when it expands, it shoots like a bullet off the face. Okay, so now we have two design characteristics. Let's swing it on the angle it was built, and let's deliver a leaning shaft to the golf ball. Perfect. How do I know that? Well, that's how they built the darn thing. Mm. What's the third thing? Well, if you swing it on its angle, then the club face tends to rotate in accordance with that angle, what we call swing plane. So you're telling me, that the entire secret for how to hit a golf ball is presented in the way they designed my golf club. Yes. So why is it that people grab these clubs and instead of swinging them on a, on a tilt, they swing them straight up and down on a straight line? Why is it that instead of delivering a forward-leaning shaft, they deliver a backward-leaning shaft? And why is it instead of having the face rotate with the plane, it usually rotates somewhere else? Hmm. Because they have no idea what they're trying to do. But... If you give someone a croquet stick, they'll use it perfectly every time because they get it. Right. They'll, stand it they'll stand it straight up and down. They'll straddle it. They'll move it back and forth. Perfect croquet motion You know, because they understand the implement and what its purpose is. Yep. So with Martin's club, the Tour Striker, it's really revealing how a golf club is supposed to work. And once people understand that, they make big progress and make it fast. And that's why um, – from a consumer product, you know, even though he is my business partner, I really do believe that he's got the best training aid on the market. I'll tell you, um, uh, one bucket, one bucket for me uh, with, with uh, one of the Tour Striker uh, clubs, and I learned so much. I keep repeating this. I learned so much about my swing and the flaws that, that were so apparent um, to everyone but me that I could not believe the, the impact of just using that club. Mm-hmm. With one bucket of balls made on on how I approach my golf shot, it, it's Absolutely. really it really is, and, you know. And I and I get an opportunity um, to look at a lot of different training aids. I get people send me stuff. I had a guy send me some stuff. He contacted me. He asked me to look at his product. Um, and he sent me the product, and I I feel terrible because I'm not calling him back because it's like what? This, yeah, really. This is no. I'm not putting stickers on my golf club to tell me how to hit the ball, mm-hmm. um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but, but it's it's his club. I, I I think that he came across something that that is really um, brilliant, um, and it's interesting that you say that about the club and and all the products that are out there. But I agree with you. Well, the other thing is that you know if if you, if someone does buy, buy the tour striker, you know Martin does a lot of video as well. It's a lot of video that's free on YouTube, like mine is. Yeah. You know, watch, watch how the guy teaches who invented the product. 
you know, because you use the product a lot as demonstrations. I mean, you're going to start to understand a mm-hmm. lot about why he does what he does, why the product works. And I think it's a nice connecting point, so to speak, between an implement that's designed to help your game, but also being able to see some of the information and the verbiage behind how to use it. So I yeah. would definitely do that. Yeah. And just to remind people, because uh, I haven't mentioned it in, an, in a number of episodes, but if you have a question for Martin, not – you know, I mean, it is your partner, but if you have a, a question about your game for Martin uh, and you send it through me, you go to uh, click on the Hey Fred at GolfSmarter.com and tell Martin you have a question. Not only is he going to respond to your question, he's going to send you a coupon code for a discount on the Tour Striker and free shipping. What so, a guy. Yeah, I mean, it's awesome. So um, please send your questions about your game. Well, Jeff Ritter, once again, it has been awesome speaking with you. I, I love the perspective that you bring to it. I, I, I definitely walk away from our conversations going, oh, now I get it. I really do, and I appreciate that very much. Thanks, Fred. I will talk to you again soon. Best of luck. If I don't talk to you in a while, best of luck with the um, <laughs> with Square It Up, with the Nike Junior Golf Camps, uh, and... The, your uh, academy with uh, with Martin. Great. Oh, and while I still have you here, for yeah. any, any golf professionals or actually any small business owners that are looking for branding services, they can find us at squaredup.com. Mm-hmm.